Robert Koch was the person who greatly contributed towards an understanding of the germ theory proposed by Pasteur. Koch was a German doctor who was familiar with anthrax, a deadly disease that causes skin ulcers. Anthrax periodically ravaged cattle and sheep and could affect humans as well. Anthrax was responsible for huge financial losses to farmers in the 1800s. Koch examined the blood of animals infected with anthrax and noticed that the anthrax has two stages. The bacillus stage which is a rod shaped as shown here in with the green arrow and the spore stage which is shown here with red arrows and the spore stage was shown to be a resting stage. Cock injected the spores into healthy mice and the spores produced anthrax in the mice which means that the spores were responsible for the transmission of the disease. To prove that this bacillus is the causative agent of anthrax, Robert Koch took the blood from diseased sheep and cattle and injected it into healthy mice. He then noticed that the mice had the same symptoms as the cattle and when he performed autopsies he found out similar signs of pathology in the mice. From the blood of these mice, he isolated a few rod shaped bacterial cells that we call as bacilli as shown here in dark blue. After growing the bacteria in culture and allowing several hours for the bacteria to multiply, he noticed that the bacteria formed tangled threads and then formed these spores. These spores were highly resistant to extreme conditions of temperature. He took these spores and injected them into healthy mice and again the signs and symptoms of anthrax appeared in the mice. When he autopsied these animals he found the blood contained anthrax bacilli. Now the cycle was complete. The anthrax bacilli is relatively large and easily identified with the microscope. Therefore, it was easy for Koch to identify the bacterium. However, because most bacteria are small and hard to differentiate between one bacterium and the other, Robert Koch had a hard time in studying other diseases. He solved the problem by using samples of sputum, blood or pus and isolating the bacteria by actually smearing the sample onto a solid surface such as a gelatin as shown here or a potato similar to what is shown here. What he obtained were bacterial cells that multiplied forming small masses that we he called as colonies as shown here by this white spot and this spot. He hypothesized that each colony was a progeny of a single cell. The diversity of such colonies is shown here in these three samples. The shape of the colonies can be round as shown in samples 1 and 2 or irregular as shown in sample 3. The appearance of the colonies can be shiny as shown in sample 1 or dull as in sample 2 and 3. Determining the colony morphology using several criteria including the shape and appearance is an important tool in the description and identification of a particular microorganism. The petri dish is a small shallow dish with a lid made out of plastic or glass that is used to culture cells. The dish is named after its inventor Julius Petri 
who was an assistant to Robert Cock. How would you prove that a particular organism was the cause of a particular disease in an animal? How could you be sure that you found the right microorganism and did not associate the disease with one of the millions of microorganisms that occur in an animal? This problem challenged scientists for decades. Eventually, Cox postulates became the accepted scientific method for identifying the agent that caused the disease. The following diagram summarizes Cox postulates through an experiment with anthrax that he performed. It allows us to learn how scientists still identify which microorganisms cause which disease. When anthrax is isolated from a disease a animal, the bacteria can be identified under the microscope or cultured in the lab. That's what is shown in 1, 2A and 2B. The cultured bacteria can then be re-inoculated into a healthy mouse as shown in 3 and after the mouse produces the disease in the healthy animal as shown in 4 the bacteria can be re-isolated and recultured again as shown here re-isolated and recultured in 5a and 5b Koch presented three rules for experimental proof of the pathogenicity of a microorganism in 1883. A fourth rule was added by E. F. Smith in 1905. Briefly, these rules are as follows. The microorganism should be present in the sick animal and not in the healthy animal or, in other words, the suspected organism must be constantly associated with the disease. 2. The microorganism can be isolated from the sick animal and be grown as pure culture. It is very important to isolate the microorganism that is present in the tissues or other samples of the diseased animal. It is also crucial to be able to obtain a pure culture of the microorganism devoid of any contamination with other microorganisms not causing the disease. 3. The isolated pathogen must cause the disease when inoculated into a healthy lab animal. When a healthy animal is inoculated with the pathogen from pure culture, that animal must develop signs and symptoms of the original disease. 4. The pathogen must be re-isolated from the new lab animal and shown to be identical to the originally inoculated pathogen. The same pathogen that is present in the original animal must be re-isolated from the infected lab animal under experimental conditions. These rules proving that a certain disease is caused by a certain microorganism are referred to as Cox postulates. Cox also worked with other bacteria. In 1882, he isolated the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, which is also shaped as a rod, thus being called the tuberculosis bacillus. In 1883, he interrupted his work with TB and started studying cholera in Egypt and India. In both countries, Koch isolated a coma-shaped bacteria. He therefore confirmed John Snow's suspicion that water is key to its transmission. In 1891, he became the director of the Berlin Institute for Infectious Diseases. In 1905, Robert Koch received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Although the work with bacterial diseases was advancing, the cause of diseases such as measles, mumps, yellow fever and smallpox was still unknown. 
In 1892, a Russian scientist named Dmitry Ivanovsky used a filter that was actually developed by the Pasteur group to filter what he thought was the bacteria that caused the tobacco mosaic disease. The disease causes mottled and stunted tobacco leaves. To his surprise, when he applied the filtrate, it, that is the liquid that passed through the filter to healthy plants, the leaves became mottled and stunted. He assumed that the bacterial cells somehow slipped through the filter. Seven years later, not knowing Ivanovsky's work, a Dutch investigator named Martinus Beijerink did similar experiments with the tobacco mosaic disease and suggested that the pathogen that causes the disease is a contagious living liquid that acted like a poison or the other name for poison is virus and that word is derived from the Latin. In 1898, Sergei Vin Vinogradsky discovered the first filterable virus affecting animals with the hoof and mouth disease. Finally, in 1901, Walter Reed, an American army physician, concluded that the pathogen responsible for yellow fever in humans is also a filterable agent.